what we are what we left on was um, dealing basically with the component of rizq insofar as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us sustenance for our material needs. We haven't touched on any of the other aspects yet. But I thought to understand the question of rizq because it is something that is clearly stated. And I'm just going to put it up and then I'm going to go back to the flow chart um, to explain it so that we at least have it captured, inshallah. So I'm going to go to the, um, uh, the last slide that left on, uh, last week, inshallah. Um, Oh. Now you see, I now the technology, the technology's got me again. This was the question which we. Uh, let me just put on this other uh, monitor, if you don't mind, guys and dolls. <laughs> um, have you got, got it up there? Yes, with the signing. Okay. So the question was, let me repeat the question and then I'm quickly move on to the, ah, you must forgive me. Now I'm battling with this because if I don't do this, then I can't see what you see. Um, Give me for this. Um, the question was, why should we go and look for our sustenance if Allah says clearly that we will get our allotted share Before we die, nothing less, nothing more, and at the appointed time. Now, if we, if we consider that, then the question was, then why should we go out and work? Then uh, I see Sidi Mudathir is not here, but please forgive me. I, I, once I get distracted, I'm, I'm very one-track minded. <laughs> Uh, at times, most times. So you're going to forgive me for this. Allah uh, Akbar. Um, okay, let me just, I think there's something wrong with my, with my phone also. Um, let me just call in the reinforcements quickly. Um, we just have quickly have an open discussion. <laughs> uh, somebody can recap to the others. <laughs> uh, Muhammad Fasih. <laughs> uh, I'm just going to call my granddaughter just to get this other phone on for me. One second. Insha Inshallah, Amir. Uh, well, for the Sadi, it's just quickly sorting out the technical issues. I think the biggest um, uh, issue that was raised in pertaining to this is the question of, so if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has already put out the rizik, 
then why do we have to work? Why is it necessary for us to go and um, make effort when everything that we will ever earn, everything that will ever be placed in front of us will be, uh, has already been put out. Uh, and I think that that was the issue that we were grappling with tremendously uh, because some people were saying, well, well exactly that. Uh, uh, I mean, what does the effort matter if everything's already been put in place? Um, and I think, I think what the point that we tried to make last week, and obviously Mr. Sally will clarify it for us, but I think the point that was we were trying to make was that even the effort is part of the process. Um, and even the, 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 the effort that we would put, have, 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 have put in place, it, it, the, the, the going to seek, all of that, how much effort, how little effort we would put in place would have counted in as part of that because Allah knows everything. Allah knows the whole story, the beginning, the middle and the end of it. And Allah, when Allah created us and Allah created uh, our destiny, Allah already knew everything and Allah created our destiny based on our specific conditions. Okay. Uh, so. I think that you know that for me was 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 an important was an important distinction. Um, but you know, so maybe you can you can Hello, share. I, I, I am back. I am back. Alhamdulillah. Now, alhamdulillah. <laughs> uh, Yunus will will come in later, inshallah. Um, sure. So the only additional point that I wish to make, um, in terms of what was mentioned last week, and I think we we. Um, mentioned quite a few things, but, and that is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that we will be tested and that we will be tested with our sustenance. So if we are going to be tested with our sustenance, we are compelled to work. Allah knows before and all of those things, it becomes difficult to follow exactly um, and put all of those things in place. So what I've done, I've decided to put up the flow chart again. I've in fact got two flow charts, a simplified one, and then the one that captures all of these things at the same time. So if you will bear with me, <clears throat> um, Allah has decreed our sustenance. Alhamdulillah, I also got this other thing sorted out so now I can see what I've got up and what I don't. Okay. So Allah has decreed our sustenance. We are told to go and seek our work. That's a compulsion on us. But Allah also tells us, and the Sunnah tells us, that there are certain things that if we do that, it can impact on our sustenance. Now that, all of that knowledge, even before we do it, is known to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why? Uh, and we all now have this clear in our minds, inshallah, that the thing doesn't have to happen first for Allah to know. Because time never applies to Allah. So whatever we're going to do, whatever work we're going to put in or not put in to pursue our sustenance is already known to Allah even before we are born. So that knowledge is within Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's sifat of being all-knowing. And that is what forms part of the decree of how our sustenance will be allocated. Now, it could be that part of the reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decrees for us sustenance is to test us. Allah doesn't want to give us a lot of sustenance. So no matter how we make dua for it, um, even though it's been told that certain things like charity and family ties can increase our sustenance, for us, in Allah's all-knowing wisdom, Allah has decided to keep our sustenance limited. And then whatever sustenance we're going to get will only be that limited sustenance. 
okay? But because we have done, uh, let me just get my pointer up. Um, because we have done the good deeds and the charity and we made dua for it, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala either removes calamities in our lives that would have befallen us or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can keep the benefit of those actions and deeds for us in the year after. But then there's another possibility. We work, we do the good deeds as Allah and the Sunnah has requested from us. We look after our families, we, 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 we uh, improve family ties, and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts that and increases our rizq. And we said that should be considered as part of the legislative will. That there are two aspects to the will. The one is the universal will, which is unchanged, no matter what we do or no matter what happens in creation that will never change, it's unfixed and it's recorded as unfixed, uh, as fixed and unchangeable in the divine decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the legislative will are those things over which we have a choice and those things can be changed in terms of what has been spelled out to us like charity, du'as and, 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 and increasing and improving family ties and our rizq will be determined like that. Now, that is the simplified one. The other, other one looks a bit more complicated, but I quickly want to go through it bef before we, we do the, um, the rest of the uh, slides. We've give, been given choices. But there are certain things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has predetermined, predestined. Now, we said that the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there are three sifat that we must consider together and they are referred to by some of the scholars as the link sifat. Knowledge would be one of it. Um, now, if we look at knowledge, whatever knowledge Allah has of what is going to happen in creation is forms part of the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is also recorded in the Lawhil Mahfuz, the preserved tablet. And we said the preserved tablet is a record of the entire history of the universe um, and it is unchangeable. It is just a record. It's just written up as a complete record. It's an archive but it's written before the world even came into existence. We're not going to go into all of that detail again. So we make choices and we do all the things that we do, whether it's work, family ties, dua, uh, and, and, and charity, and that knowledge of what we are going to do forms part of Allah's all-knowing knowledge. And that informs how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to deal with the question of our rizq. Of course, the other sifat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is power. Without power, no matter what actions we want to put in place, we can decide to do, do something, but it doesn't necessarily mean that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will allow us to do whatever it is that we do decide. For some reason or other, uh, you may find that you are unable to put your choices into action um, and that depends on the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala impacts directly on what we are able to do or not able to do. Now comes the one which deals with the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The actual decree of the amount of sustenance that we are going to get. The first part, we said the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there are two aspects to it. The divine will, which is unchangeable, 
and we said the legislative will, which can be changed, it's possible for it to be changed uh, if we do certain actions. That's re referred to as the legislative will, and our actions can impact on that. So say we do all of the things that the Quran and Sunnah uh, tells us to do, we do it, then that can bring about the change in our rizq. So I hope that part is clear. Then comes the second component, and of course it's recorded in the reserve tablet as such. Your rizq has been changed. Then comes the second part. <clears throat> the second part is the part that deals with the unchangeable will. Whatever Allah has decreed, you're asking for more sustenance, but Allah has decided to test you and not to increase your sustenance. In that case, your rizq remains unchanged. But you've done everything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted you to do. Of course, that's also recorded in the um, uh, preserve tablet. Everything is recorded. What happens in the universe is recorded there um, the way it eventually happened. And as we said previously, because you've done all of these things, yeah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can, subhanahu wa ta'ala can either remove calamities in your life or keep the reward for you in the year after. And that is recorded in the scale, the mirzan, um, when all your deeds are going to be measured. But we must remember our condition, uh, our deeds are going to be measured, but also the circumstances and the conditions that applied in our lives will all be measured. Like if you were very healthy and the other person was very sick, all of those things get weighed. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not unfair. Allah takes into account every single thing in creation. Of course, the scale will also measure when you were given increase in the rizq. How did you use that? You asked for more and then Allah gave you more. How did you use it? That will be measured. Your actions... And your book of deeds, of course, um, will form uh, a big part of what is measured on the scale. And then at the end of the day, whatever the scale is going to measure, where you're going to land up, is already known by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and recorded in the preserved tablet. Okay. Can I throw open the floor and find out if there's anyone who wishes to ask anything? I see there's some new people uh, and we welcome all of them. Um, and I just want to find out and we encourage them because this is a, 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 a very interactive forum that we have here. We encourage them to ask anything that they want to or even a comment that they wish to make with respect to what we've outlined uh, so far. So I'm going to open up the floor for comments or questions if anyone has any. Let's hear. Um, Dasali? Yes, Yunus. Okay, so since our, 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 our last class that we had, um, I think the, the, the concept that we were battling with when it came to whatever, uh, the, the, the common phrase, you know, Alice is it, yes. um, and it's specifically with reference to our rizik. Um, the, the same error we make or misunderstanding um, when we compare when Allah said, uh, instructed the pen to record all those people who are going to Jannah and those who are going to Jahannam. Yes. Now, we've established in previous lessons that Allah didn't decide 
um, like a blanket statement and say, almost like any, 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 mo, you going there, you going there. Um, it was based on how everything unfolded within the realm of time and all this knowledge is all encompassing in that sense. Yeah, Allah's so when, one, when we Allah's reflect on, on, on Rizik, the, the physical manifestation of Rizik, the same can be applied. Um, we, the events that has happened in the realm of time, um, like Peter Sali just explained now, there are two aspects. The one where it is fixed, can't be changed, and the other aspect within the legislative world, um, where our deeds and our choices and our actions come into play and how Allah responds to it, to our actions, to our eyes, to our way that we, um, all those, those, those actions that can increase it. Um, also the fact that sometimes our, our actions can decrease our, our rizik. Yes. Um, so the blanket statement to say, why should I gain work? If it's already decided what I'm going to get, um, that's exactly why uh, we should be cautious in, in that type of understanding. Um, Shukran, so there's certain things that we have a choice in, and there's certain things we don't have a choice in. Um, only Allah knows. So in the sense of having to go and seek one's rizik, um, as an example, somebody can work himself to the bone and still only earn minimum wage. Um, and somebody else might not put in so much effort, yet Allah places him with so much physical wealth. Um, not to say that one is better than the other, but it's specifically to that individual. How is he able to, as a test, um, how is he living out his life within that specific condition that Allah has placed him in? And like the Sali said, the, the one who is constricted in physical wealth, um, through our dua to Allah, um, responds in, in different ways, either um, as, a, as a reward for in the Akhirah. Um, but I think the key point in, in all of this is not to become so engrossed with the dunya in itself, whether we are, have limited or constricted wealth, or that Allah has blessed us with abundance in physical wealth. I think the key point here is what is our relationship with Allah within those conditions that will count most uh, for us, inshallah, in the Akhirah. Shukran, Yunus. Shukran. Um, very, very uh, uh, good understanding. Let me just hear uh, from Aisha um, whether the question she asked um, is now covered of why we should go and work. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam, Aisha. Um, now, now, um, when you uh, said it's an obligation, I immediately understood and everything, all the pieces fit. Um, what I just want to mention is that Allah says we must strive, go out and strive and work for our material rizik. But I think um, strive also means charity. Um, to our, that's also work. So if you neglect that and you, you only go and do your physical labor, then you're actually you're restricting your rizik as well by not uh, striving in the other areas. I don't know. Yes. Just, I was just thinking that. Yeah. Um, in fact, the other, other part is even more important is that if we, if we take the point that you are making, and uh, it's true, yes. But you can't go and, and look at fi family ties and make dua and you don't go and work. The work is an obligation. Family ties are recommended as additional extras. If you don't make dua or you don't give charity, you're not necessarily going to be punished. But if you don't go and work, you're going to be punished because of the obligation. So you can't do the one and not the other. But if you go and work, you can, if you choose to, you can leave the others. So it's important that we understand the, the, the concept uh, in totality. Any final comments on this before I move on? Okay, let me move on. 
Shukran. I, I, I hope that the, the concept is clear. And let me just say, this applies to everything when we talk about what has been decreed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The same concept, the same concept, the same flow chart. You can put in lifespan here instead of rizik. You can put in health. You can put in uh, uh, whatever else it's important in your life. You can put it in there and apply the same flow chart and it should in fact be uh, applied in exactly the same way and you will come to the same understanding inshallah. So I hope that has been um, understood and if we need to come back to this, we come back to it until everyone is able to take this flow chart and explain it on their own to whoever they want to. Uh, let me just allow somebody in here quickly. Um, okay, so Alhamdulillah, we, we are ready to move on to the, to the, um, to the next slide. The technology, Ekan technology. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give me uh, the ability to deal with technology. <laughs> you know what that is, of course. It doesn't require a rocket scientist to recognize that that is a photo or an image of poverty. Uh, and it's, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a clip of a township. Now, Sheikh Hazim Allah said to us, we must feed regularly. That's why the program that we have to feed, although many of us don't actively participate in it the way we should be, we actually don't realize what a big opportunity it is that we are actually missing on. If you can't participate in the actual distribution of the food, then at least assist in the preparing of the food. If you can't assist in the preparing of the food, then at least donate towards it. That is what Sheikh has um, told us to do, that we should be uh, feeding the beggars and the poor um, and assist wherever we can. And whenever we are dealing with them, we must deal with them with kindness and compassion and with generosity. Because Allah and His Rasul loves the poor, the sick, the orphans. It, the Quran and the Sunnah is full of examples of where we are told that those are the people who will make up the majority of the people in Jannah. The people who have lived hard lives, not only because of poverty, but because of illness or any other hardship. They were the people who will be first to enter Jannah. The other point um, that Sheikh has also reminded us about is that you cannot expect Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to look after you uh, and supply you with all your needs. If you, uh, if you only trust and have reliance on your job, you're more concerned about what, what the boss thinks because the boss is the one who supplies you the job and therefore gives you the money and that's how you think you are going to survive. You must see that that is only a means through which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala supplies your rizq. So we should have utter and total trust and reliance only on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's not easy. There are people who lost their jobs now. There may be people within this group who have lost their jobs. And if you don't have a job, the rent is not paid, there's no food on the table. That's the time when Allah really tests us. Do you still have utter and full trust that I will feed you like I feed the birds when they leave their nest and they come home with 
with a full belly? Have we got that kind of trust? So utter trust and reliance is an essential foundation to access the benefit of this name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And one of the ways is we must practice that kind of generosity that we expect from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as the khalifas of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on this dunya, we must practice that generosity to each and every person and every creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, not be too selective. You are Muslim or you are not Muslim. You are uh, 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 whatever. Don't use criteria to determine you're a sinner, you're not a sinner, you're Muslim, you're not Muslim. Like Allah supplies rizq to everyone and everything in creation, try and emulate that. If you can't give physically in the form of charity, then assist the hearts and minds of people to guide them as a means of being charitable. Now, we know how to feed the body. We should know uh, food and drink. Without food and drink, the body dies. But how do we feed the mind? And how do we feed the soul? Can I throw that up as another question before we go into how it is dealt with here? I'm going to throw the floor open now. Uh, I think if I can take a crack at it, uh, feeding the mind is the pursuit of knowledge. Um, and uh, I, would, I would dare to say the pursuit of, 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 uh, of physical and spiritual knowledge is a benefit to the mind. And uh, feeding the body is all because it's an ibadah, it is feeding the body what halal means in the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has designated uh, that we should feed. So, not through haram means, and also through the method instructed by Rasulullah. So, not overeating, uh, not eating in a manner that is, is gluttonous, and uh, observing. The ni'mah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through the process of eating, because that also forms part of eating, I think so. That's my rough analysis. Alhamdulillah. Anyone else who would like to add to that? Um, yes, Peter Sali. Yes, Imam Hussain. The feeding of, of the soul. Yes. The food for the soul, of course, is dhikr and fikr. Alhamdulillah. It's contemplation. And he's uh, remembering Allah. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. That is what the, the nourishes the, 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 the soul. For the body, we have uh, 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 um, foods, different foods, such as to upkeep the body. For the mind, for the intellect, it is knowledge. We must seek knowledge. Um, and then for the soul, of course, as thicker and thicker. Alhamdulillah. Shukran, Imam uh, Hussain. Let's, let's move on so that we can just go through the slides. In fact, uh, what people have said, uh, we will just add to that if, if, if and when it's needed. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala nourishes the mind of human beings. You see, there's a difference between knowledge and beneficial knowledge. If we look at what we get on the, on the Facebook and WhatsApp and all the different uh, technologies that's available out there, you can get flooded with information that can keep your mind occupied from the kiyama. But it doesn't mean that that knowledge is necessarily beneficial. So when we say knowledge, it's important to say beneficial knowledge. And beneficial knowledge should assist us 
to get to why we were created. Why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala create us? The obvious answer that we all know, we were created for, to make ibadah. And on this path that we are pursuing of where we are trying to purify the heart, the scholars in Tasawf has told us that we will be created to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's our chief purpose. There's no other purpose. The other purposes are secondary. The primary chief purpose is we should live our lives so that we can get to know Allah. So when we talk about beneficial knowledge, it should be knowledge that assists you to get to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala better. And in the process, while we are pursuing that kind of knowledge, then the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala assists the slave is to remove doubt and uncertainty and giving answers to questions that you may have had. You didn't want to ask anyone because the question is too difficult even to explain. But it's something that worries you. The moment you come across anything that you don't understand and you are uncertain about, then you have an obligation to go and seek that answer. So one of the ways that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala nourishes the mind is to actually remove that uncertainty by supplying you with knowledge in whatever form, whether it's an article, whether it is uh, orally, verbally, or whatever means that Allah supplies the answer to you and it removes that uncertainty. And that's a powerful way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala assists the mind from being nourished. And just another point to quickly make, uh, we talk about uh, sustaining the body. The body is an amana, it's a trust given to us. If you don't look after the body, you're going to get punished. So you can't say, I must feed my mind and my, my, my soul. Uh, and you don't look after your body, you must give the body the haq that it requires. But the awliya in pursuit of uh, taskiya, the purification of the heart and the soul, um, they've cut themselves off completely and secluded themselves where they would not make any effort they have total and utter trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will sustain them. But they've reached a level. We're far from that. We must go and work. <laughs> Let me make that point. Otherwise, we're all going to sit there in the mountain uh, and hope that it's going to happen. And we are not there yet. But they have reached a point where through this name of al mukit the Narisha, they've made it their companion in that journey to get to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they don't have to sustain themselves like we do as uh, weak normal slaves and they get sustained through that name alone without eating or how they eat how much they eat would would not be enough for us as ordinary human beings uh, I thought one of the things we we should remember is that the mind is as wonderful as it is. We are able to, to send spaceships uh, uh, to other planets and to the moon and even uh, explorations out there. But the mind is a limited organ. The mind can only take you to the door of the unseen world. The only thing that can take you through and give you access to the to the unseen world, to the ghaib, is the soul. <clears throat> so the mind is the gateway to the heart. And it's with the heart, the purified heart, that we'll be able to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So removing any uncertainty or incorrect belief is a primary, primary um, obligation on all of us.
That, that, that's not something we're going to have a choice about. If Allah gave you the ability to come up with solutions and answers to satisfy the mind, then you have an obligation to do that. Um, is there a slide that you're busy sharing? Um, oh, yes. That, that's what I'm going to do now. Um, now, we made the point that to pursue beneficial knowledge is something that we, we, we must consider as very important. Um, and that the question that we must couple to that is that pursuing beneficial knowledge, but we must also do self-inspection, introspection, and self-examination. And when we do that, it purifies the heart uh, in a rapid way. And Imam Hussein has, has reminded us that um, the, the ability to, to do dhikr and fikr and khidmah and tawbah are all the things that accelerates this process of purifying the heart. The mind is breaking up again. Uh, uh, subhanallah. It's clear now. Okay. Um, the other thing that can purify and assist the mind tremendously and bring nur to, the, to, to, to your heart is to look around you and reflect on the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in creation. That's one of the methods that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has determined for us as human beings. If you want to get to know Allah, then Allah says, Look for my science in creation. So that's why you can't just say, yeah, but that is scientific knowledge. Scientific knowledge is a powerful way of trying to understand the, the science of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, in creation. So I'm just quickly going to uh, go through the other slides. The nourishment we know for the body is, is uh, what we mentioned. But Sheikh says that the mind gets nourished not only with true knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but also with subtle meanings. What does that mean, subtle meanings? Meanings that people would attach to a certain thing that they hear or read and understand in a particular way. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives the slave the ability to read into that something more than what other people see. You are given insight because knowledge has different levels. Because knowledge is the sifat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is no end to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's knowledge. If you climb the ladder of knowledge, it has absolutely no end. Nobody can ever know everything about everything. No one. No prophet, no malaika, nothing in creation. Only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows everything about everything, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will nourish the mind to climb this ladder of knowledge, which in reality is totally endless. And with each step that it takes on this ladder, it will get insights and understanding that the normal person would not be able to, to, to get. And then for the ruh, it's the illumination um, through the kirfikr, uh, uh, the other forms of ibadah. It's a powerful way, um, but also that the light of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the divine nur, when it enters, when it enters the heart, then it lights up the heart in a way that uh, we can't really understand and, and, and describe. The only point that we, we wish to add, being of service to other people, um, must be coupled to bigger fikr and khidmat, as Imam Hussein has indicated. Because without those things, without those things, your soul shrivels up and, and, and deteriorates like a dead plant that doesn't get water and nourishment, and it's, it, it, you can see how it just gets weak and weak and weak until it dies out. Now your soul depends on the food, and each food eat all those things uh, that we've mentioned, bigger figure, figma, toba, and of course the compulsory things that we, 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 we are uh, expected to do. One of the practical ways of practicing, uh, or let me say, practicing generosity, kindness, consideration, mercy, and com compassion to others is a practical way in our daily activity that is offered to us to dispel the veils of darkness. Now, what are the veils of darkness in the instance of what I have used here? What's the opposite of generosity? Miserliness. If you are miserly, then it creates a veil of darkness. So when you are generous, you dispel that veil, you remove that veil. Kindness, uh, what's the opposite of kindness? Cruelty. Uh, I can't think of any other word for now. Um, if you're kind, then that veil of cruelty uh, is removed. And so we could go on. Uh, consideration um, removes the veil of inconsiderate mercy, uh, compassion, uh, all of those things dispels the veils by the qualities that are created by its opposites. And once you remove the veils of darkness, with total trust and reliance on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you allow the divine mood to enter 
not only into your mind, but into your heart, but not only into the heart, into every nerve and organ of your body. And not only that, but into every cell, not only every cell, every atom of your body, where you become totally illuminated with the Lord of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, we are far from that, but if we practice practical things like generosity and kindness and having a soft heart, then we can get closer to that point where we start benefiting like the Uliya has done. Um, before I come to the question of the advice of, uh, of what Sheikh has told us, let me just hear if there are any uh, comments or questions that anyone would like to ask or present before we go to the final part. So, number one, is there anything you wish to say? Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Nothing to say. I was enlightened by this knowledge. So, alhamdulillah. May Allah increase our knowledge. Yeah. Thank you. Anyone else? It's Tassali. Um, Sheikhs, Shehazi, Hafizullah. Um, his words come to mind now when one, one day she said, um, specifically on, on Allah being Ar Razak, um, she said that the, the physical wealth is one of the lowest forms of Allah's rizq. And the only, well, the, the thing that will benefit us in the Akhirah is the beneficial knowledge that we know of Him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is what will benefit us in the Akhirah. Um, so it was an encouragement for us to pursue um, beneficial knowledge, alhamdulillah. <laughs> I am I'm I'm struggling here. Did, could can you hear me? Just point uh, Sidi Marwan if you can hear. Alhamdulillah. Um, so we will go over to to the advice of Sheikh, inshallah. Um, Sheikh Hazim Khafid Allah says that the one who attached himself to the name of Ar Razak and for that matter uh, Al Muqit um, must, as a starting point, not only acknowledge but firmly believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has no partner in providing for him in all of creation. That means we should not rely on our jobs. We should not rely on people who can assist us when we are in difficulty. Um, it reminds me of what uh, Sheikh Abdul Qadir Jailani Khafidullah uh, um, said in, in, um, in uh, he says that the problem with human beings is that when they are confronted, when they are confronted with a difficulty, the first thing they do, they try and sort it out themselves because they believe they, it's easy enough to solve. They think they can do. Let us remind one another that the only one who can create effect is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When we dealt with the issue of power, we said, Allah created the doer and the actions of our doer. So we should never believe or trust in our own abilities. But now we do what we can, but we fail. What's the next thing we do? We run to somebody that we know, that we think can solve the problem for us. And you go to that person and he's not able and say it is money, then you go to your boss, you think your boss is going to help you, he's going to give you an increase, or he's going to give you a loan, or, or you go to the bank and say, I want a payment holiday on my bond or whatever, and you think that that's going to be your solution. And if they all say no, now you've exhausted all your opportunities, what do you then do? Now you only turn to Allah. Now you only turn to Allah. 
What do we do in our everyday lives? What do we do? If you know somebody is in difficulty, a friend of yours, he goes to 10 other people, then the last he comes to you. By the time he comes to you, you say, no, man, uh, you went to all of those people. You didn't come to me. Go to them. But Allah doesn't do that. Allah is merciful. We should learn to trust Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala right from the word go. Don't even trust our own abilities. Have complete and utter trust. Now we are very, very, very far from that. All of us. But it's something that we should work on. We must introduce it in our lives. The smallest problem or the most obvious solution that you have to a thing that you think, oh, I know how to do that. Don't trust yourself. First, go to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and invoke Allah's name to ask you, to assist you. Because you know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who can provide the answer. And that's why Sheikh reminds us that Allah has no partner. Don't you set yourself as a, as a partner or anyone else as a partner and then turn to Allah. That's the foundation. When you do that, Sheikh says, you'll be, be granted beneficial knowledge. What is beneficial knowledge? We touched on it. Beneficial knowledge is the knowledge that's been given to the Arifin, the knowers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will open up an understanding where you get to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala better. And we said that that is an endless ladder. You will climb that ladder and you will continue on that ladder which has absolutely no end because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's perfection has no end. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will grant you that type of knowledge. But remember what we said previously, that the amount of knowledge that you will get or benefit you will get will only be what your heart can cope with. And what your heart, heart can cope with or ready to receive that benefit is dependent on the state of its purity. That's why cleaning the heart, the process of taskia is absolutely crucial. Because when you purify the heart, there's nothing that can block the nur of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from entering your heart. And on top of that, Sheikh says, if you attach yourself to this name and you make it your companion, you recite it regularly and you start understanding it and you believe in it and you trust in it, then you will try and emulate it in your everyday life. People don't have to ask. You will be generous and you will be seen as a generous person and you will behave like a generous person. And Sheikh gives a specific um, application for this name. Sheikh Hafid Allah says that if you recite the name 10 times prior to Fajr Salah in each corner of your house, but you must face the Qibla, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not only increase you in sustenance, but sustenance for the mind, body, and soul. What that means is that the nur of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will enter your mind. And when the nur of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enters your mind, you are able to think and understand and reason in a way that you've never ever been able to reason and think. And to understand complex things, to remove difficulties and uncertainties, and to come to a point where with your mind, you have firm and solid belief, unshakable belief. Allah will grant you that. But the biggest, <laughs> the biggest treasure that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you is if the nur of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enters your heart. Because that is the vehicle which is unseen. Allah is unseen. And Allah prepares that vehicle to understand Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala better. 
So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for us to benefit from this name so that we can also be the people who can taste a fraction of what our Murshid Sheikh Hazim has tasted and what he advises us to do. So um, I'm going to leave it on that note um, and, and take the final round of comments and, and, and questions um, at the stage. Okay, I've, I've opened up the, the floor. The Sali, the, the, the notion of, 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 of people, you know, as far as Allah is concerned, He guarantees us our rizq. Uh, we don't uh, trust, we don't have confidence, you know, that Allah is the Razik. Mm. Like we find the birds, they would go out in the mornings and they would return you know, with food in the in their beaks for their for their kids and so forth. But we actually shows a, a bad bad adab to Allah if we worry and we stress about where tomorrow's uh, sustenance is going to come from. And yet Allah promises us. You know, that rizq, but we worry about it. And the fact that we worry and stress about where the rizq is going to come from is actually shows a lack of, 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 uh, as a lack of, 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 of trust in, in, in Allah's uh, um, promise. Yes. So that is actually bad adapt towards Allah. We must actually have trust in Allah that, you know, whatever He has created, He sustains. And rizq is, is, is sustenance. Yeah. No. Shukran. Shukran. Shukran, Imam Hussein, for that. Um, it's a good reminder to all of us. None of us are free from this test. We are tested with this and all of us all of us fall in that trap of forgetting about this. Muhammad Farid, is there anything you wish to say at this stage? No, alhamdulillah, um, the statement that Yam Hussain uh, just made was very profound and very deep. That uh, That's a lack of adab shown in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And uh, that I think is is is, is quite uh, a lot enough to contemplate about. Yes, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. Anyone else? Can can one also say that it is sinful, not just a lack of adab to fear poverty, to become anxious and to worry about tomorrow? Can one say that is sinful? <clears throat> um. Allah knows, Allah knows it's difficult. I can only say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is my view, Allah knows that better than anyone else. I can only say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us with all the, with the creases and with all the weaknesses. We, we didn't create ourselves. We are what Allah created. Allah created us like this. So us. And I would venture to say it would be considered as a weakness, in my view, but not as, as long as we become aware of it, that we actually try and do something about it. But I wouldn't really personally see it personally. I wouldn't see it as a sin. But for the Arifin, the knowers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even the thought is a sin. So it depends where you are on this road of purification of the soul that determines whether it falls in the category of a sin or not a sin.
any 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 other final things that anyone else wishes to say if not then um, can we ask uh, yes assalamu alaikum wa alaikum salam ati amina um can ik maar net eh iets zeggen ana van dat zal ik en die vorige lessen die dat zal ik zeggen van eh ons met eh alles ons met van eh alles en namen eh zie bijvoorbeeld ons ik ik zal altijd een een mijn liefde zet zoals thankfulness en sabber in as a means te dankbaar is vir Allah en sabber in jou liewe sit, dan sal, dan sal sy, dan sal sy dit van, van, waar van aan jou risik, en sy sal, sy is te vrede met alles wat Allah vir jou gedekree, sal ek, ja, die amen, the word that I used was adopt, you adopt the name, you take the name as your companion, Now, why do you want to use another name when there is a name like Razak or Mukit? If you want to have security of sustenance, then the barakah of that name will accompany you wherever you are. So I would say, uh, yes, every name that we use of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to Allah, not to anyone yeah. else. So Allah has all the qualities of all the names. So in a sense, you can use any name. But the name that's recommended for this, as Sheikh has said, you will get sustenance for your mind, body, and soul if you attach yourself to the name of Ar-Razak or, or Al-Mukid. Uh, so, yeah. shukran for that, Ti uh, Amina. Shukran, Tamani. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, shukran. Um, It is also, also another name, uh, Tasali, yes. the name Wahab. Wahab. It's the, the one who bestows, the one who bestows Wahab. And uh, it's, it's recommended that you, you say this name uh, 82 times uh, um, after you've done your Salat Uduqa. You go in Sajda and you say the name 82 times in Sujood. And that's also a means of, 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 of uh, attracting, uh, getting sustenance. Uh, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Alhamdulillah. Shukran. And the name Wahab. And Mughni. Mughni. Mughni also. Provider. I think. Ghani means uh, 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 um, to enrich, the one who enriches. Yeah. You, you see, almost all the names, almost all the names have that element of attracting the nur of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And, 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 and looking after our sustenance. You can also even use Mujib, the, the one who responds to your dua. So yeah. the, the, the same thing about Allah sustaining our minds, bodies, and soul oh. will be repeated as we go through the other names. So it is not exclusively that, but Sheikh has, and, and we are guided by what, what our Murshid says to us, uh, as suggested to us a particular formula that we must recite this name 10 times before Fajr Salah in each corner of the house. Mm. Um, and then we will get that. Now, if we attach ourselves to Sheikh, we take his advice. Uh, yes, we can use other means, but now because we have attached ourselves to Sheikh, we will use that as the means if we are seeking security of sustenance, inshallah. 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 Shukran. Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah. Um, my apologies once again for the internet um, and the disruptions, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Um, can we ask Sidi Mudathir, uh, Imam Hussein, to make a closing du'a? Yes, sure. Sidi Mudathir, if you are with us. Wa alaikum wa salam. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين حمدا وفي نعمة ويكافئ مزيدا الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله اللهم صل صلاة محسنة وسلم سلام
من محسن على سيد المحسنين وإمام المحجلين سيدنا محمد الرسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم اللهم رزقنا معرفتك يا الله اللهم أنت العارف عرفنا بك يا الله اللهم أنت العارف عرفنا بك يا الله اللهم أنت العارف عرفنا بك يا الله اللهم أعطنا أمل الرجاء وفوق الأمل اللهم أعطنا أمل الرجاء وفوق الأمل اللهم أعطنا أمل الرجاء وفوق الأمل ياهو 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 يا من بفضله لفضله نسألك العجل العجلة إله الإجابة الإجابة يا من أجاب نوحا في قومه يا من نصر إبراهيم على أعدائه يا من رد يوسف على يعقوب يا من كشف ضر أيوب يا من أجاب دعوة زكريا يا من قبل تسبيح يونس بمدى نسألك بأسرار هذه دعناك ربنا أتمم لنا نورنا واغفر لنا إنك على كل شيء قدير وحسبنا الله ونعم الوكيل ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم سلام على نوح في العالمين استجب لنا آمين فقطع دابر القوم الذين ظلموا والحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد النبي الأم النبي الرحمة وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين شكرا جزيلا ان الله سبحانه وتعالى bless you and your family and shower his mercy and his blessings on you um, the name that we are going to deal with next uh, next session inshallah um, is a name that might not be very familiar to 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 many people al wasi' the vast it's got other other scholars have given different uh, 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 interpretations to this name uh, but that will be the name that we are going to be dealing with inshallah um, we urge everyone to make a special effort because this name has got subhanallah it's got hidden meanings in it that we must uh, must try and understand inshallah so uh, I wish to bid you salam and uh, hope inshallah that we will all be uh, able to uh, I don't know I pressed the button I don't know what I pressed here <laughs> um, okay. uh, everything of the best and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep you under his protection and his guidance Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen and shukran for your attendance. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Shukran for the job well done. Alhamdulillah. The message came across loud and clear although we had some sound problems. But alhamdulillah. We're still successful. Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah. Shukran. Alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. To be continued. Ah, not this one. Shukran. Assalamualaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamualaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaykum salam. Wa alaykum salam.